It's easy to compartmentalize God. You know, over here we've got our sacred, quiet time, church experience, and then over here we have the rest of our lives. We well, y'all, God wants to be a part of all of it. And that's what we're discussing today, taking God out of the box and letting him have a say in all areas of our lives. Welcome to What If We Were Real. I would like to ask you for the single woman that is watching, what is it that we can do to be appealing to good godly men? Like, what is it that you see in a woman that makes you go, aha? Mm. You know what? In a godly woman, I think one of the things that makes me aha uh-huh, is the, the transparency, the, 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 her just being able to ex- talk about how she's imperfect, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> that she needs. I think the greatest thing about godliness is person finding out that they're flawed, that they do need Christ, and that they're, you know, they're continually trying to reach towards them. So, like, mm-hmm. kind of, kind of what you said earlier, it's that you know, I'll, I, I need a godly woman, but I need a real woman, yeah. you know, somebody who's just like, hmm. you know what, this yeah. is because I'm flawed, yeah. <laughs> and, right. Right. and we, we're all flawed, yeah. and so. Mm-hmm. So I, I appreciate when a, when a person, when a woman, you know, just is mm-hmm. transparent and real. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. Austin. I think that's a huge one, the transparency. Really somebody that's just humble and is just aware of that, you know, this is life, it's gonna be difficult, it's gonna be really hard, mm-hmm. but, you know, they're looking for somebody to do it with, mm-hmm. you know, that you're kind of partnering together and just realizing this life is gonna be really hard, yeah. but I know that I wanna pursue God and love hard, yeah, you know? Yeah, so good. And learn how yeah, to Yeah, I love that. It's good. Good. I think for me, just someone who can talk. <laughs> like they yeah. can just have a conversation, not surface level, not, you know, just always about business, but like talk and like yeah. have real in-depth conversations. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. also a servant, you know? Um, that one day if we were to have a family, that there'd be a servant in the house, mm-hmm. be a servant as we're in public and, mm-hmm. and meeting people. I think those are two of the most attractive things so for me. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna I'm a speak on a practical because I agree with all of what these three said. Mm-hmm. And so I just want people to hear both yeah. spiritual and practical. Yeah. These three were spiritual mm-hmm. and I agree with all of them. Mm-hmm. I want that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even appealing to a man is take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. You know Agreed. what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. show right. that you right. that you are your number one asset. So take care yeah. of you. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, don't. I asked this question in my singles panel, and I, well, I didn't ask this question, uh, but I think sometimes single people, our bar is set too high when we know we're down here. Mm-hmm. So it's like if if wow. you want some someone of a high caliber. Make sure that you are high caliber. So good. Mm. Love that. And so, uh, but I definitely agree. She's got to be godly. She's got to be transparent. When I met Brent, his like character preceded himself. Mm. That's how I always describe him. We're like, we actually didn't talk about Jesus for the first five dates. And I was like telling my therapist, I need to break up with this guy. (laughs) And then I prayed and then he actually brought it up in our like date. Yes. Mm. And so I think that. I had dated so many men that talked a lot about God oh, yeah. and talked a lot about yeah. being a Christian and all those things, but their actions, so the good. way in which they yeah. didn't perceive, like they just didn't match up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was, his character preceded him. So mm-hmm. I, I would say that as I got closer to meeting Brent, I feel like the character of the men changed. And I was seeing men that were good men. They just weren't, we just weren't a good fit. Yeah. And, you know. So you didn't talk about Jesus your first five dates. Mm-hmm. Could you, looking back, mm-hmm. can you see fruit from Jesus living in him without him having to say it? Yeah, really. and the way he pursued me because he never texted me. He always called me on the phone. He was so intentional (laughs) about the way, I know. That's great. I know, (laughs) right? That's great. I was like, what? Well, because after our first date, it was nothing. We went to a coffee shop too, and I was like, it was nothing. Both of us kind of looked back on that, and I was like, it was fine. Yeah. Like, it was a fine date. But then he didn't text me. And for I, how long? For like, it was only 24 hours. But <laughs> later in that, like, listen, no, later in that day, I texted him. I was like, thanks so much. It was really nice to meet somebody else from Pittsburgh. And he's yeah. like, cool, nice meeting you too. Nothing else. For, for how long? Like, 
Like, what do you mean? So nothing else. You're saying that's when the 24 that's, hours passed? And, and then, okay. yeah, 24 hours, and then I get a phone call from him. That's so awesome. Then, yes, yes, it was yeah. so sweet. Mm-hmm. So I think I could see that, and that's what my therapist asked me. She yeah. said, but he's doing the things that a godly man would do, yeah. right? Like, he was yeah. very intentional. He was not aggressive. Like, he was just, he had, like, planned these really wonderful dates that no one had ever really done for me. Mm. Just the way in which he asked questions about my life. Like, I could see Jesus in him. Really? And I knew some of his friends. So I'm like, okay, he wouldn't just set us up. Like, yeah. <laughs> knowing me and then knowing him, it wouldn't have made sense. And so... Um, by the time we got to that conversation, I was like, oh no, I'm in trouble. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Knowing that God changes people, right? We're all in this process sure. in our journey with Jesus and being led by the Holy Spirit. And what if you meet a guy who mm-hmm. maybe has a terrible past or maybe is new in their faith or mm-hmm. just now coming to their faith? Mm-hmm. I just have learned not to shut anything down until God tells you to shut it down because he could end up being this great amazing man of god and it might not take years and years you know he could be on a fast track when i look at who i was at 19 compared to who i am was at 23 Mm -hmm. it's two different people and it was a quick change yeah i didn't grow up in the church or any of that so i don't ever want to just shut somebody down so much because they don't look the way i think they should look but also boundaries and making sure Mm -hmm. they respect where you're at and what you Mm -hmm believe and hopefully he is in love with Jesus. I mean, even if you look at the life of David, like there were portions of his life where he was doing the complete opposite of what you would view as a Christian man, you know, but yet he was named as a man after God's own heart. And so I look at that and I'm like, what is the key? Is it a matter of having all your ducks in a row and having everything lined up? Or is it a matter of humility? Mm -hmm. When David was called out, he was willing to say, yeah, I did that. That's right. I'm going to change my heart, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, for me, I'm like he said, when it comes to the whole legalism thing, like I grew up in the church, my dad's a pastor. And so coming into even mm-hmm. in my 20s, I was like, there's <laughs> got to be all these different things, you know? Mm-hmm. I, this guy has to be a small group leader. This guy yeah. has to be this. Yeah. This guy has <laughs> to be that. And then actually, you know, stepping into this relationship that I'm in now, not to say that like there's no standards, yeah. but it is to say that there are going to be things that we're constantly working out in life and the key for me is not a matter of some guy that has everything set up perfectly it's more Mm so you know because life will happen there's going to be other things in life too that come up and they're going to be challenges but if i can see that that person is reacting to that challenge in a manner that says okay, I'm gonna try to do my very best to ask what does God want? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna make some mistakes sometimes, but I'm gonna always come back to a place of of self-correction. I'm gonna come back Mm -hmm. to the center. Then that's what I want in a a man, Mm -hmm. not someone that just has everything perfect. Yeah, that's so Mm -hmm. good. Isn't it interesting, y'all, when we think about who Jesus applauded and said, look at this person, yes. Yes. never the religious Pharisees. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was the Samaritans. It was the outsiders. Like mm-hmm. it was the tax collectors. Do you think that that says something about how we as godly women somehow come off? Like we can be very, mm-hmm. you're wrong. And yeah. I just, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that actually has a role to play in our relationships and mm-hmm. in how we view men. Like, mm-hmm. do you think that there is something to that? Yeah. I think there is. And I also think almost on the other spectrum that we don't hold high enough standards too for what Mm. our standards are. Mm. I know that's true for me. Like if I look back on my 20s, like there was a lot of stuff I put up with that (sighs) were just not acceptable ways to be treated. Like what? Um, I was in a, what I call a situationship. (laughs) (laughs) Coin that, you can trade my guys. Um, But I was in a situationship with a guy for like nine months. Didn't define what it was. Mm. um, Wouldn't take me out on a date. Like all these things that I was sacrificing because I thought eventually he will. Or I'm sacrificing myself for him because he's on paper a great Christian Mm. man. But He wasn't acting like it, Mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest. So I think it's almost the other end of the spectrum where we maybe look at those black and white rules and then then don't actually be honest with ourselves about Mm -hmm. how the person's treating us, which is the fruit which you were talking about. So I don't know. For me, that's been the case. That came with age, though, for me, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Having their fruit, seeing that manifested and not just going along for the ride because he says he's a Christian man. Right. Um, 
Mm -hmm. I need you to show it as well. So mm -hmm. that was one of the questions actually that was asked on social media is, and I could tell this person was asking from a place of experience. Yeah. She mm -hmm. said, how do you know that a man is actually godly mm -hmm. more than just what they say? She said, I actually dated somebody who said that he was a godly man, but now I look back and I see that there was nothing that he did that actually mm -hmm. represents that. Mm -hmm. So how can you tell? Like it's more than just what they say, right? I think it's what other people are saying about them. Really? I I, yeah, I f some of the guys that I'm actually attracted to more now than like back then, like it's because like their friends talk so highly of them and mm -hmm. I watch how kind they are to people mm -hmm. and the generosity and I, you know, it's like and that to me is so attractive when I'm like, wait, everyone around you is saying all these really incredible things about you. Like, should I be paying attention? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. should I yeah. get over, you know, like you know like what what's going on here i'm i'm suddenly curious cuz all of a sudden like i keep hearing these great things about you and it's not that you're coming in telling me because that is like okay you're really arrogant um but when when it's uh, all the people around them walk you know like that you're I, it's like this summer i was at a friend's birthday party um and I was blown away because I didn't really know, like, and it's not even that I'm still that close to the person, but like, didn't know him that well, but I get to this party and everything everyone's saying about him, I was like, wow, you are really an attractive human. Really? And like, and he already was, but yeah. I was just like, I am so intrigued by you right now because of the way that every person that walked in this room has spoken so Ooh. highly of you, of your kindness, like of all these things, of like how much you love the Lord of all, and I'm like, Oh, like, and it was all when I like look back at it, I'm like, that's actually the fruit of the spirit that I'm hearing mm -hmm. all of them talk about. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, like yeah. that's, that's a man of character. So earlier in the panel, we had a panel of men. Um, and that's one of the things that we talked about was that we all have flaws. And that when I say I'm looking for a good godly man, that how do you define what a good godly man is. Like, I'm not saying perfection, mm -hmm. but I guess what I'm saying I want a good godly man is, is he chasing after the Lord in a way that I'm chasing after the Lord? Mm -hmm. And so when you say that we're all flawed, tell me anybody here, when you um, found your wife, you two, were there things that you saw that made me go, oh, that's a red flag. I don't know if that's gonna work out. And why did you look past it? Hmm. Do you wanna go first? Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel like the awareness of our own brokenness is vital to understand the picture of grace. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like my need for grace yeah. uh, informs the extension of grace into the world. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thankful uh, that I've been able to recognize my own flawed nature and my own mistakes mm -hmm. and my own brokenness and recognizing what I've been rescued from. Mm -hmm. Uh, helps me celebrate the rescuer, which in turn helps me to extend an, an amount of grace. So I think the hopefulness that I would receive grace from my now bride uh, kind of shapes the way that I see what it means to understand who she is inside of her mm -hmm. reality. And yeah. it's not even just in her brokenness, but just mm -hmm. in who we are, just yeah. as John was just saying. Mm -hmm. I think we all have things about ourselves that we're on the way in mm -hmm. and those things are different and manifest differently. Mm -hmm. And I think to your point, I think there are perceptions from the world and from other people that unbeknownst to John or unbeknownst sure. to me uh, are uh, expressive in their understanding of who I am. So yeah. holding all of that intention to go, yeah, like there's mm -hmm. my own view of my own brokenness, yeah. but also my view or lack of perception of what people are seeing in me. Yeah. So I think ultimately for me, it comes down to drinking deeply of grace mm -hmm. helps me to extend grace. And in those times where that's not happening, yeah. Mm -hmm. then yeah, it's gonna be, uh, it's difficult. I'm realizing <laughs> my list is changing. Now yes. I understand, oh, I want somebody with a servant's heart. Mm -hmm. I want somebody who is humble. Mm -hmm. Like those are the things that are now becoming yes. important to me because now I'm running into big black born again believers with bald heads and goes tees, go tees. And I'm realizing, oh, but you're so prideful. You're so full mm -hmm. of yourself. And mm -hmm. so that's the kind of list you're saying. It's good to have the things sure. like humility, mm -hmm. servant heart, totally. maybe throw out the yes. stuff that doesn't matter mm -hmm. quite as much. Yep, yep. Did you have a list? I didn't have a list. I feel like the biggest revelation has 
I'm a why centered individual. <laughs> and so I feel like that informs so much about my life. Why centered as opposed to? What centered. Okay. <laughs> so I feel like uh, what you just described is a what centered way of thinking. And what mm. Natalie is kind of yeah. ascribing to is this thought of our what's being what mm. prescribes the way that we think. And um, why's speak more to motivations, mm. more mm. to like it's the really essence, good. you know? Yeah. And I think one of the things so that I've found mm. is one, to, to be quite honest and frank, uh, I was at a place where I was willing to say, yeah, it's me and God, like we're just gonna ride or die and single, whatever. How old were you? Uh, I was 20, probably 25 when you I You were saying that, that at like, 25? Yeah, I was ready. I was ready, man. I was <laughs> Just because I feel like uh, my connection to who God is and what that meant to my life just informed and shaped everything. So my why just shifted. And so I say all that at risk, I understand of sounding over spiritual, to be honest, but I feel like my why was so much more around God's desire for communion with me mm-hmm. more than what I hoped to have mm-hmm. in life, whether it was a relationship or money or a job or stuff or That's things good. or whatever. And so that came after a season of suffering. I talked a little bit about my childhood, all those different things, but in connecting with Jesus, it changed my why. And so the one thing I would say is, you know, you weren't asking this, but just shifting toward that idea of what it means to think about things in terms of a list. I just feel like understanding our why, especially as people who would say we're followers of the way of Jesus, I think one of the things that we forget so often is the true point of being a follower of the way of Jesus is to be with Jesus. Like we see it as a formality and like a a data point into the things we want. And we're kind of like, yeah, I want a Christian man because I need to throw the Christian part in there, but I want a man (laughs) or like I want a woman or I want to, you know, do a job, you know, all those different things. And so I just think when it comes to the list, again, I feel like I was such at a place of resolve to go, man, I get, and it goes back to what you were saying about spending time, hearing the voice, experiencing communion, and communion with God is the greatest gift that we could ever receive. And so I always just felt like, man, if there is someone who can get in on this and be down for that, cool. Like, if not, I'm good. Like, I'm for real good. And so when she came into my life and she'll she knows this too like she'd say it it was a surprise to me it was a surprise to go one that we're even doing this like i'm even thinking in that realm and then two yeah from a list standpoint again it was not something that i would ever predetermine from a type of person or nationality or background or whatever Mm -hmm. but i think i was in a unique place and kind of set up to win in a sense because there literally wasn't I, i didn't have that you know encouragement make a list and this is what you want Mm -hmm. it was just more like do you dig jesus all right find more of jesus and keep going until you can have more jesus for marriage it was not the whole you complete me but i am whole because i'm made in the image of god and so in two of us whole people are Mm -hmm. coming together and just to give a hundred percent and even if ron doesn't do right or whatever Mm -hmm. if he doesn't accept it i still have to give 100 percent took me a real long time to get that okay (laughs) 11 years but um but yeah once we came to that then Mm -hmm. our marriage just like was able to blossom Mm because it was like i'm serving the lord in you yeah so whatever you do, it's like mm. I'm looking past that Come on, because girl. God has called me to serve you. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And yes. so, yes, I will cook. Yeah. <laughs> the way I look at singleness is not um, why am I not married? There must be something wrong with me. The way I look at it is what does God want me to accomplish right now that I could not mm. accomplish if I was married? Okay. So what what does what does this ability of me not having kids right now or not having m- being married right now? What is he wanting me to get done? Yeah. in this moment that maybe would look different mm-hmm. if I was partnered up. So what is God wanting to do in you and through you in this moment that you could not do yeah. once he brings your man? Now, now there are going to be all kinds of cool stuff that are going to happen once you do right. get together. But there's certain things that you, you can accomplish right now that you might not be able to accomplish. So what's this posture that you can have in this moment that says, ooh, 
thank you, Jesus, that I'm single right now because you've yeah. got things that you want me to do. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do right now? Thank mm -hmm. you, God, mm -hmm. because everything is a blessing. Everything is a blessing in your moment and in your season. There's a tension in the kingdom of God. Yes. And there's a there's this constant tension where you're like, well, I don't want to go this far, but I also don't want to go this far. And yeah. I gotta live, I gotta live in the tension because the tension mm -hmm. is what makes you rely upon God. Yeah. yeah. The tension is me saying, I cannot do this. I you know, we are carnal human beings. We would be out there doing all kinds of yeah. stuff if it wasn't for Jesus. Yeah. But I also can't go full on to this other way and say like, no, I don't desire to have sex. Sure. To me, being afraid of God is thinking that he's judging you right. and he's harsh mm -hmm. and he's angry. Having a fear of God is I want to actually do what he tells me to do. Mm -hmm. Because number one, not only do I want his blessing, but I love him so much yeah. that I want to please him. Yeah. I want to do and live in such a way that I honor God. And as I honor God, he's actually going to honor me and understanding how that cycle works. Mm -hmm. But I think that we're in a generation of people, even in our in our churches, where mm -hmm. it's like nobody talks about that because they're so busy talking about grace, mm -hmm. because they're afraid that people are going to run the other direction. Right. But we have an illiterate yeah. generation of people yeah. that don't understand what it means to just actually want to live to please God mm -hmm. more than anything else. Yes. Like I want to please Him. I want mm -hmm. to do what honors Him. I want to do what's holy and I want to do what's right. Mm -hmm. Not what I'll be forgiven for, mm -hmm. but I want to do what's right. So and I think that that is kind of missing. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? And mm -hmm. that, don't you think that's related to the fact that we have a generation that hasn't read their Bible? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have found his presence to be so near to me in the times where I have felt lonely and yes. where I am crying myself mm. and saying, God, yes. when and why, I will ask for his presence to envelop me. 100. And I used to think that maybe that was just something that I had because I'm mm. single and my only obligation mm. is to the Father. But I know that you could say that also as a man. Absolutely. Woman. And I think that, you know, his presence, like we talk about his omnipresence that is always with us, that he never leaves us and never forsakes us. But there's a difference between his omnipresence, which is um, being all places yes. at all times and his manifest yes. presence which is his presence made clear yeah. and I think that for me it's his manifest presence that again as a married mm -hmm. woman if I'm looking to my husband to be that for me he'll fail every time mm -hmm. and that's unfair to him mm -hmm. because he was never created to, to meet that need in my life only God can meet that sure. need. And mm -hmm. I was recently just studying Exodus. It was Exodus 33 and the children of Israel are learning about what their sin does with their relationship with God. And Moses prayed this prayer. He said, he first said, God said, I'm going to kind of hold my presence back from you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to still deliver you to the promised land, but I'm going to actually hold my presence back from you. And Moses said, what good is the promised land without your presence? Like mm -hmm. we all think about life as a destination where we need to get in order to be happy, married, single, all these things that we're trying to get to as a destination where God is saying, it's actually my presence mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is the great fulfillment of your yes. life. And Moses was saying, cause it's your presence that sets us apart mm -hmm. from all the other people on the earth. And then he prayed this, show me your glorious mm -hmm. presence. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, for you, whether you're single or married, whether you're fulfilled in your job or you're unfit, whatever it is that you're seeking after, for me, I've been more challenged even recently, 21 years of marriage, mm -hmm. God, show me your glorious presence. Yeah. Like show yeah. me your glorious presence because in that manifest presence of his presence made clear mm -hmm. is actually where you find your greatest mm -hmm. So good. Yeah. Love I that. was gonna say, as you are single and you're staying in his presence, you want to take that when you get married. Because yes. I know for Ron and I, if we're like fighting or it just feels like, oh my gosh, why yes. are we not on the same page? Yeah. And then we can like look at each other yes. and be like, okay, what, how much time have we spent with the Lord? That's yeah. so good. So it has nothing to do yeah. with us, yeah. yeah. but it's all about wow. our so personal good. relationship. So if you are gaining yeah. that already, which already goes back what you're doing while you're single, yeah then you're already ahead of the game. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And there's yeah. another thing to that too, just to jump in. It's like, you know, much is made about Paul's proclamation that it's better to be single, mm -hmm. you know, and, and- First Corinthians 7, I love it so much. 
but the reason that he makes that proclamation is supported by all the other writing in the 13 letters, which says to live as Christ, to die as gain, uh, man, just to be in his presence, to know his presence. And what he's essentially saying is to be married is the potential for another thing to interrupt <laughs> the worship mm -hmm. and the presence of God. Mm -hmm. wow. So what he's saying ultimately is it's better to be single because I do not have anything that will steal yeah. <laughs> the worship mm -hmm. of God and yeah. the opportunity to commune with him and to be in his presence. So he's not saying you functionally are better as a single person. Mm -hmm. He is saying, what does he say? I know, I, now I'm the Bible <laughs> guy. <laughs> I wish that everybody were as single as me is what he says. And, and I would always say, yes. Right. <laughs> but the reason he says that is in 1 Corinthians 13, where he says, mm -hmm. therefore, my friends, flee idolatry. Yes. Yes. Flee anything that is an interrupter wow. of worship. Mm -hmm. So his proclamation to say singleness is better yeah. is not because of functionality. It's not because of your flexibility. Some people will kind of take that tact and go, man, it's just because you can do more and you yeah. can. Yes, that's technically true. But what he's saying is, you do not have one more thing. Like as a married person, yeah. it's the person that you love more than any other person mm -hmm. in the world. And it's incredible. And as Katie said earlier, like there's a whole other subset of blessings that come from being married. Mm -hmm. That being said, <laughs> the why behind the what is <laughs> communion with this God book, I tell you first. What. <laughs> and so with the communion with God first, he is saying, that is the greatest thing that you're ever going to experience and nothing will ever replace that. So therefore, be careful because yeah. <laughs> any introduction of anything, yeah. mm -hmm. especially someone who will be with you every single day for the rest of your life, yeah. there's the potential for your affection that's intended for God to go to places that aren't really meant for God. <laughs> you brought up something about 1 Corinthians 13, mm. Mm. and I have actually been on a kick lately where I'm thinking less about looking for Mr. Right, yeah. trying to focus more on becoming Mrs. Yeah. Right. Mm. And I use 1 Corinthians 13 as my guide. Like, mm. love is patient. Mm. I'm not always patient. Lord, yeah. help me to grow in patience. <laughs> love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. Like the whole 1 Corinthians yeah. 13. What are some things, as you look at the 1 Corinthians 13 list, what are some things that you can say as married people? What are some things that you can say that you have grown in that quality hmm. because you were married that maybe not so much when you were single? Please. Yeah, all of all them. Of them. <laughs> yes. All of them. Really? The answer is 100%. yes. All, and that's not, that's not like, uh, we're not blowing that out of proportion. Yeah. Like that's the thing that I, I want my single brothers and sisters to understand. Mm -hmm. Like there's a depth of surrender in marriage and then another depth yes. in becoming a parent that uh, it's it's hard work. Mm -hmm. So those of you who have the freedom of not being, you know, married, which there's a blessing in that yeah. too, but mm -hmm. if you have the freedom like uh, accept the beauty of that freedom mm -hmm. because, uh, listen, when two people come together and, and God is in it, you're perfectly matched, mm -hmm. but you're perfectly mismatched as well. Mm -hmm. And my wife, who is amazing, um, isn't perfect. And, and I am perfectly sent to her to, uh, to, to hold up that mirror and to cause her to see herself. And my children do it too, you know, and she does it for us. And so God is calling us deeper and deeper and deeper. And for me, I always come back to the fruits of the spirit, mm -hmm. you know, love, yes. joy, peace, patience, kindness. Like we, we're, it's like, God is calling me deeper into the fruits of the Spirit through these people that live in my house and won't go away. <laughs> you know, so there right. are times that I long for uh, for more freedom, the the freedom of single uh, singleness, because it's it's just the depth to get pulled under into that depth costs you something. And so I listen, I know I've said this a lot during this time and I, I love being married. I wouldn't trade it for anything for the world. But I came here with the intention of blessing single women, especially and men to, to that you're, you're not lacking anything. You're not lacking anything. Yeah. And for uh, for my married brothers and sisters out there, um, if there's any any gift that I could give in, the, in these final moments, it's that your your spouse is not your problem. Your spouse uh, is not broken. 
you are broken. You are the one to do the work. So earlier we were talking about don't cause your brother to stumble. The the great lesson for me, like I'm I'm constantly I'm early in marriage. I was like, look, she's doing it again. She's doing that thing I hate again. She's doing that thing to hurt me again. You know, and really it's like, no, I am doing that. I am I am looking at whatever she's doing and just her humanity, you know, just her, just being there, doing her at the very best that she could do that day. And I am interpreting it in mm. such a way that it's an offense to me. Mm. And now all of a sudden I am this, can you guys see that this is yeah. the work of the Holy Spirit in my life to say, hey, Chance, yeah. mm -hmm. you, you are the one. She is not causing me to stumble. I can, I'm the only one in Chance's brain. Mm -hmm. I'm the only one in Chance's heart. No one else can cause me to think something or feel something or do something. I own it. So listen, it's up to me. It's up to you. You go get your work done mm -hmm. and your spouse go get their work done. And when you come together, now you have something solid. So I love that you're saying, hey, I want to be Mrs. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the way to go. Yeah. And, and just so you know, you won't get there before marriage. Mm -hmm. And on the other <laughs> side of marriage, there will be another level and another level and another level. Yeah. So good. Snaps chance. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, Can I ask? Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. No, yeah, I, I remember I read this book by this guy named Gary Thomas, and it's called Sacred Marriage. Mm. And the subtitle is really all you need to read. You don't even need to read the whole book. It's an incredible book, and I would love to have a conversation with that dude sometime. Mm. But just from the subtitle, he basically says, "What if marriage wasn't to wasn't intended to make you happy, but to make you holy?" Woo! And I think that to me is the very definition wow. of what you're asking, yeah. which is yeah, in marriage, do you find yourself so growing in these attributes in, you know, First mm. Corinthians 13? And these attributes 100% come as a result of the refinement and shaping mm. and, you know, so yes. So good. Wow. <laughs> Years ago, I watched this sermon series by Andy Stanley called The New Rules of Love, Sex and Dating. Talking about keeping it real. <laughs> well, in it, Andy talks about focusing less on finding Mr. Right and more on becoming Mrs. Right. That's where I got that from. And so he talks about 1 Corinthians 13 and how we can use that as a guide to become Mrs. Right or Mr. Right for you fellas out there. So let me explain this a little further. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses four through seven in the Passion Translation says, love is large and incredibly patient incredibly patient. I can't say that those words would ever be used to describe me, but it is something that I am asking the Holy Spirit to help me to grow in. And when you ask God to help you to grow in patience, you can expect to be in the fast lane of the freeway and having the slowest driver in the world in front of you. Like that's just a way that you grow in patience is by being put in situations that test your patience. It continues and it says that love is gentle and consistently kind to all. You know when it's difficult to be consistently kind? When you're dealing with what I call extra grace required people. Those are the people that God allows in my life to test my grace and my patience, but I'm learning to become consistently kind when I'm placed in those situations. It continues and says, it refuses to be jealous when blessings come to someone else. The other day, I heard that a friend of mine had a number one bestseller on Amazon. And this is an area that I've been growing in, is choosing to be happy and celebrating my friends when a blessing comes their way. That's because I've been trying to meditate and study 1 Corinthians 13. Love does not brag about one's achievements, nor inflate its own importance. I don't wanna feel the need to prove myself. And so I don't wanna brag about what I'm doing or how well things are going. I want to grow in humility. And that's what this passage helps me to do. Love does not traffic in shame or disrespect. The other day, somebody said in the comment section, shame on you. And I immediately knew, oh no, God is not a God of shame. And so I can just toss that out. On the other hand, I need to also learn to not be disrespectful because sometimes y'all, I get in my feelings. And so that's just something that God is helping me to grow in. 
It says that love does not selfishly seek its own honor. You know, the Pharisees do that. When they enter into a room, they want the highest seat of honor. They wanna be applauded. And I don't wanna be like a Pharisee. I wanna be like Jesus, who would take the position of a servant. And so that is how I choose to not seek my own honor, but to seek the honor of God. It says that love is not easily irritated or quick to take an offense. All I gotta say about that is social media. <laughs> we need to learn to not be easily irritated or so quick to be offended by the things that people say. Y'all, the comment section on social media can be a hot mess or it can be used as a tool for the Holy Spirit to help us to not be so quickly offended. It says that love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others. Is there anybody in your life that maybe you have a hard time believing the best in them? This is an area that the Holy Spirit can help you to grow in love. Love never takes failure as a defeat, for it never gives up. Invite the Holy Spirit to help you to focus less on finding Mr. Right and more on becoming Mrs. Right. Leave a comment in the comment section below and let me know how are you trying to unbox God and letting him infiltrate into all areas of your life. And if you're enjoying this, would you give me a little thumbs up to tell me that you were liking it? And be sure that you subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and share with others if you are enjoying these episodes, because I'm loving spending this time with you. I will see you next Wednesday as we start to wind down the end of this relationship series. We're going to have a little bit of a hodgepodge of random stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks. And so I can't wait to see you then. Please.